but I would like to focus on the role of the church in uh, the social uh, transformation of uh, uh, the Ukrainian people uh, today. So I would like to note three key uh, points. Uh, first, how today, in line with the social teaching uh, of the church, how do we uh, appraise uh, social uh, structures? Uh, second, what is the role of the church in society? And third, uh, what is our task uh, for the Euro um, Ukrainian society to assure that the challenge of uh, political transformation and the enlargement of um, European unity uh, in line uh, with the challenges uh, mentioned by Prime Minister Yatsenyuk. What is the role of the teaching of the Church in this context? So first, we perceive uh, the society uh, as structured as follows. We have the political and uh, government administration structures. We have political processes with political parties. And uh, there are business entities and uh, economic activities in societies. Everything else is civil society. Uh, society of uh, ordinary rank-and-file citizens, not centered around any uh, political structure, any political party or business interests, but simply people realizing tasks which they perceive as tasks for the nation and uh, people organize themselves to uh, be masters of their destiny, building their future. The church perceives its uh, role as part uh, of uh, civil society. It's integral part. I remember how uh, Archimandrite Cyril, uh, from the Orthodox Church, claimed that about relations between government and the church, there is also a relation between the church and society, the nation, the people that the church should address people and their conscience, uh, those people who uh, are the um, fabric of the future of um, society. So the church perceives and understands society in its own way. And even the Orthodox Church begins uh, to recognize the existence of civil society as uh, uh, so the church is also a phenomenon reflecting the existence of civil society in Ukraine. You know that uh, in a totalitarian state you can't seriously talk of civil society which is either physically destroyed or is uh, driven underground or simply doesn't exist. Uh, so a dignity a revolution in our understanding of social developments is a revelation, is a phenomenon of civil society. I'm sure you all know that initially there were two Maidans, a social one, a spontaneous one, and a political one. And uh, they emerged in different uh, places. Uh, the uh, civil Maidan was at the Independence Square and the political one at another location. But then the politicians joined the people at the Independence Maidan. And as a church, as the um, uh, Greek Catholic Church in uh, Ukraine, 
we uh, understood that uh, that's uh, that our place is with the people not with business not with the uh, government not uh, with the state but uh, with the people with the nation who uh, rose in demand of uh, their own uh, of respect for their own dignity so you need, even if uh, you become aware of your own dignity, uh, this already drives revolution. And that's the key uh, principle at the same time of the social teaching by the church. Uh, and it's the key principle of European uh, civilization. And secondly, it is obvious that uh, the European Greek Catholic Church has always uh, been uh, with uh, the nation. Uh, our church has always been part uh, and mother, uh, as it were, of um, uh, Ukrainian civil society in times when we didn't have our own state. The church uh, fulfilled uh, functions uh, which were uh, absent in state structures. Uh, for example, uh, Archbishop uh, Sheptitsky was not only an ethnarch of the uh, Ukrainian nation, but uh, also under the conditions of um, um, independent uh, Republic of Poland between the wor uh, world wars, he was able to develop a uh, um, Ukrainian um, business entities with a Ukrainian bank with uh, structures uh, in the country. Uh, the followers uh, of this, um, uh, the heads of uh, Sheptitsky's bank to, um, today form national structures uh, taken over by the state. Uh, uh, or the uh, imprisoning in Stalinist uh, prison camps uh, of uh, Patriarch Slippy uh, when uh, he was released in 1962 he was regarded by the international community as if he were an informal president of Ukraine behind the Iron Curtain, uh, despite the fact that uh, he was uh, kind of enslaved. So uh, when we talk about the 20th century, uh, the European Greek Catholic Church was one of the largest Christian communities which was uh, pros uh, persecuted. Talking about the Soviet Union, we were the largest opposition group against uh, communist rule in the Soviet Union. And even the Soviet Union wasn't unable to destroy it. Uh, it's obvious that after the rebirth of uh, Ukrainian statehood, uh, there was a stage of the emergence of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church uh, from underground, uh, which was one of the uh, triggers, one of the initiators of social and political change in Ukraine. So our Greek Catholic Church, uh, joined later by other churches in Ukraine, was not only part of society, but also uh, one of the best organized parts uh, of our civil society. We have various religious and social organizations, communities, uh, which are so sometimes branded as fake uh, communities uh, in times where everything is falsified, including uh, including civil society. But Ukrainian churches uh, enjoy the greatest confidence uh, of uh, our nation, maybe even excessive um, confidence. We haven't. Uh, 
uh, we don't deserve this, but uh, we do feel a huge responsibility g given the trust uh, placed in us. So, under current conditions, the task of all Ukrainian churches is to remain part of civil society. On the one hand, there is this, um, the risk of uh, becoming uh, too, uh, too closely bound uh, to the state. Uh, and being involved in uh, political uh, processes, which is a short-lived uh, approach because uh, being uh, connected to political structures or parties leads to discreditation of the church during uh, successive elections. There is also uh, the risk uh, of the church uh, becoming part of an oligarchy where a great oligarch simply buys into a church in order for it to serve its interests. So today we have the challenge of staying with society, with civil society, and it is also a historical church, uh, choice on the part of the church. And uh, the third aspect, how we perceive today our role, our task, our mission. Uh, the paramount uh, task uh, for our church, and uh, I mean not only as part of uh, a religious community, but also as a community of uh, believers, regardless of um, uh, membership of any particular church. The church should be a, um, a leader, a, a spiritual leader for society. We have an organization which is called the uh, All Ukrainian Council of Churches and uh, uh, Civil Society. It uh, joins all three Orthodox churches, all Catholic churches, both uh, in the Latin and in the Greek Byzantine tradition, and uh, even Protestant uh, churches and uh, also the Judaic faith. Uh, the head uh, rabbi of uh, Ukraine uh, calls this council the largest NGO of Ukraine. So, uh, being so different and yet united, uh, we try to elevate ourselves above uh, the uh, differences across our faiths and to speak with one voice uh, uh, to the people of Ukraine. And here we are united by uh, the quest for the common good. Uh, the truth uh, which we need to um, tell people, uh, politicians and business, is uh, that uh, goodness is above all. And uh, one of the key internal problems of Ukraine is the issue of corruption. Everyone is fighting corruption. The international community above and the quest for anti-corruption institutions inside Ukraine. If we don't understand within the country that uh, corruption is a moral evil, that it's a sin, unless uh, we build up a national front against this evil, we won't succeed. And uh, if, uh, we cannot get rid of corruption in Ukraine by external means. We won't be able uh, to get our hands on all the corrupt men. So our church has started uh, um, uh, um, 
teaching the people against corruption together uh, with um, even uh, the Protestant church, instructing um, the churchmen also how to uh, react uh, to confessions of corruption. So uh, we have uh, mm, announced a new intolerance for corruption, a moral intolerance. As Christians, we should understand that uh, this is moral evil uh, just as bad as uh, the ex uh, as what we are to told from the outside world. And another uh, contemporary example. Tomorrow elections will be held in uh, the Russian Federation. And uh, we are aware that the winds are blowing uh, from uh, that uh, uh, side uh, trying to discredit elections as such in society because in many countries elections are turned into a big show and people are disillusioned uh, they uh, find that uh, there are no candidates uh, worthy of voting for uh, so uh, churches and uh, religious organizations in uh, Ukraine teach uh, the believers that it is a um, civil uh, obligation to participate in elections. So we encourage everybody to uh, to vote, to take part in elections, and we launch a campaign of uh, prayers for uh, just and and. Uh, fair elections. We are also, uh, uh, we, we have an election campaign already in uh, progress uh, before subsequent elections next year. Uh, so we are trying uh, to um, educate uh, people to become uh, fair and just politicians, businessmen, who would be responsible uh, to the people. And finally, I would like to end on a positive note. In May 2014, uh, following the drama uh, of the events in Odessa, uh, at the time I was in uh, Canada meeting uh, the Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs in Canada, and they were telling me such uh, uh, terrible uh, things are happening in Ukraine. Do you have any hope? And I said, yes, of course we have hope as Christians. And all the doubts then disappeared. So looking at our rank and file citizens who strive to build their own free and independent country, ready to sacrifice their lives for it. And so I see the future of the Ukraine in its people. So I appeal to you to believe in the future for Ukraine. Uh, do feel uh, the voice of the people who are building up Europe in Ukrainian society. So I thank you for your solidarity and I appeal to you to have faith in Ukraine.